Welcome to the first Hellraiser vlog of 2016 with Mickey Helliot. Mickey, how are you? Thank you very much. I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Very good. Good, good Christmas good. and good break. Do you know what? Very chilled out. I actually think maybe we could change the brand because it was called Hellraiser <laughs> when I was a young man, still had a full head of hair and I was going out partying every night. Whole of Christmas. I can't, I'm trying to think. I, I can't actually remember having, oh yeah, well, the Hellraiser Christmas do, which yeah. was a curry place, and we yeah. didn't go out smashing it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a tame affair. It was very tame. It and was that, very tame. Yeah, that was my um, my Christmas going out. And I, oh, I, what can I say? Shield out now. Old man. There you go. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a busy year for Hellraiser this year in general. What's the calendar looking like? We, we, we've got a massive, massive year lined up. It's going to be a good, really good year. Right, so we, um, boxing-wise, we start um, in January the 28th at the Park Lane Hotel. I've got uh, Mayfair Sporting Club, which I've been running now for, what, 13, 14 years, something like that. In Mayfair, running Black Tide. Uh, it's like corporate black tie boxing dinners. Um, it's actually probably my favourite dinner show of the year, the, the Burns Night. We had like a, a recital, it reads out like the uh, Robert Burns poetry and we have a bagpipe guy and drink whiskey and uh, it's a big night. And uh, it's like the end of January, so it's like everyone's had that little break after Christmas mm. and then uh, they go out and um, well, and the, the, the venue, the Park Lane Hotel, the, the Sheridan Park Lane is Reminds me, actually now I prefer it to Cafe Royal. I used to love Cafe Royal and I feel like everywhere we've been since then has been like a slight step down because you haven't got the chandeliers and the, the Art Deco mm. set up, which you have got in the Sheraton. Actually, I prefer, yeah. I prefer the, the Park Lane Hotel to the Cafe Royal. It's just mm. like perfect. It's an impressive venue. You walk in there, it's got the wow factor. Um, yeah, and uh, so that's our first one of the year. Uh, it's a uh, like a, a, a good start, good way to start. Then February at York Hall, well, nearly all our shows, Hellraiser shows, going to be at York Hall this year. Uh, obviously now we've got the gym here in Limehouse, uh, the, the Sports Medicine Centre, um, Limehouse Marina Elite, meaning that we're getting more and more East London fighters, meaning that we... I like the Camden Centre, it's worked really well for me, it's been very, very good for me, we've had some brilliant events there. But now we're getting more and more fighters from Essex, from East London, from, from this sort of neck of the woods. Um, so it makes sense to go to York Hall. Um, we booked uh, 10 dates there this year. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I've, I've promoted there many times before, just haven't been there for, for a little while. I think it's a couple of years since I was. I know we did it the end of last year. Yeah. Yeah. But now right, we've got 10, 10 this year. And uh, the, the first one's going to be February the 27th. Mm -hmm. A massive card, mm -hmm. a huge, huge. There's so many people signing up now with, with different things that we're doing. I think it's attracting mm -hmm. them. Obviously, the gym, the, the TV deal with London Live. Yeah. Um, two Southern Area title fights, right? We've got two Southern Area. So we won the first bids, Wadi Camacho, who trains in our gym, but I don't manage against Daniel Gate, who doesn't train in my gym, but I do manage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I like both of them. You know, obviously, I got, well, I would say, a uh, soft spot for Dan. I managed him. I think he had one fight at the start of his pro career before I started managing him. Then I managed him from then till now. Always with the aim that we're going to win a Southern Area title. He's got a big, big opportunity here against Wadi. Um, bit of an unfair advantage that I'm in here, so I can see Wadi sparring, I can see him training every day. Um, to be honest, my, my tactics that I would speak to Dan about, I already had them, and I've seen what he boxed loads of times before we trained here, so I already know, you know what he struggles with, what he does well, who he does well against, so it doesn't really actually make that much difference. No, it's not like I'm studying Waddy every day. Mm. Um, I already know how he boxes, and yeah. I know what Dan's good at, and what he's effective at, and that's, that's the tactics that, that we, we're going to follow. I was happy because he's now trained with uh, Ian Burbage, and I spoke to Ian earlier this week, and I sort of told him, no, this is what I think I always do. I don't stick my nose in too much because I like it. I don't like the trainer starts telling me how to promote. I say, all right, get your checkbook out and you can promote some shows and you know, yeah. do it your way, you know it better. Because it happens sometimes, you hear little comments and things. I mean, okay, well, you do it, you know, see. And the same, I don't like going to trainers saying, well, no, you should do it. They're devoting their 
life to training boxers. Like, let them do it. You know, they're, they're experts in that field. Ian Burbage is an expert at training boxers. I've seen him work. I believe in him. I have faith in him. I know he's a good trainer. He's a very underrated guy because he's not the sort of bloke that's going to go around writing silly press releases out and try and get his face in cameras and stuff like that. He's just a guy that loves boxing, loves training boxers, works very hard, diligently, quietly, um, but effectively as well. You know, he brings guys on and guys that I've put with him that were not particularly talented or um, had had that great amateur careers um, have done very well with him. So. Uh, he's done a good job with Lenny Dawes, who got oh, severely ripped off the other week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, he's working with, with Dan. Ian actually said, he said, this is what we're doing. And it was exactly, pretty much exactly what I want him to, to, to work on. So I've got every confidence that um, on the night, Dan Woodgate will be crowned as Southern Area Champion. We, um, we, we are uh, trying to, get it obviously so that he, he can win that and then go and defend it. I think um, we are at one advantage. Waddy is actually boxing on the David Ho David Hay undercard. That can sort of work two ways. I think either one, it can distract him Waddy from the second fight because he's got something to focus on first. Or it can take the attention away from I don't think like a boxer can compete twice in that short period of time. Mm. No, he's got like, you know, uh, not that long between the two fights and boxers normally do best when their, their preparations are like that. Mm. Um, either he can take his eye off the ball in the first one, which I hope he doesn't, because if he doesn't and gets beat, um, it impacts upon <laughs> the, the, the second fight, um, certainly the marketability of it. Um, if he takes his eye off the ball on the first one, we've got a problem. If he goes and has a fight and gets a knock or an injury or something like that, then, I mean, for sure it would be a distraction. Makes it harder for Waddy in the second fight. So I'm not that bothered about him, mm. him fighting. Um, Do you think it's an advantage then for Dan Woodgate? Yeah, massively. Yeah. Because Dan Woodgate's got one day to peak on, he'll be peaking on that day. He's sparring in the meantime, you know, we've got plenty of Southport sparring lined up for him. Mm. And um, against good, good guys, probably better guys than Waddy. So he will be adjusting to those kind of guys and then uh, by the time we get to fight night I think um, he'll, he'll be very well prepared. So that's top of the bill. We also have the second Southern Area title fight is Tamu Kamucha and Tommy Tier. Yeah, that's a good, good fight. That's a good fight. It's a very hard one for for Tommy and it's one that ideally I would have liked to see on TV on, on our London live shows. <coughs> and London live doesn't start till April. We've got 10 dates this year starting in April. Um, it will be a hard, hard fight for Tommy, but we're backing him. We hope that he goes and does the business. And um, at least he's got home with it. See, both for Dan and for, for Tommy, um, we, we moved heaven and earth to give them home advantage, make sure it's on our show. We give them every, every way that we can load the dice in their favor, we, we're doing it. As a promoter, you know, promoter can't go and start it sort of punching the opponent and start, start fighting before the boxing. Yeah. We, we can only do what, so much. So we, yeah, we try and make it as comfortable and, and you know, easy for them. Who else from your stable fighters will we see on that February show? We got, you know, I think we've got so many people signed up the last few months. I mean, we, we, we're looking at the moment, I think it's 22 fighters. We have a massive bit of boxing. We'll start very early, work its way up the bill to the, the, the top of the bill guys. We've got uh, Aaron Morgan, who's going to be an eight-rounder. Big year for Aaron this year. Mm -hmm. uh, he was um, he had a good year last year. Uh, for me personally, I'd like to see him box a bit more often, but it's hard, you know, for fighters that are doing the one ticket sales that have to go out there and market themselves. It's sometimes awkward. So, and if they like, there are people that live from boxing, like the money they make. That is, they don't really have that motivation to go and box for small money, sell less tickets, but then they, they fight for less. Um, someone like Aaron, I think he, you know, he wants to go and get good money. And look, he, he's done things right to start off, so now he's working towards getting himself in a position where this year he's mandatory for the southern area. Uh, Chris Aguirre didn't want to fight him, go and fight on a uh, matching show, but we're mandatory, so we fight the, the winner of that. And I favour Aaron to beat the man who wins. Aaron beats him. <laughs> mm. That's him, southern area champion this year. 
Uh, Daryl Williams, will we see him on the February? He's on the Daryl Williams, Southern Area Super Middleweight Champion. He um, is on there. He um, had a great year last year. Do you know, yeah. he, he really um, set, set his world alight and he impacted on the Super Middleweight division in a massive way. Um, in honesty, if I'd have wanted to get him rated in the world ratings, I could get Daryl rated now. I know I could get him rated now. The the only thing holding it back is Daryl didn't Daryl didn't have that many amateur fights, and um, it's a bit like a racehorse. You're holding him back, hold, but you know, trying to keep him at a certain pace because I don't want to just sort of I don't want him, his career to be like that. Okay, I, I want him to build up and to actually go far higher because we we've gone steady with it. So he will have a six rounder in the February show. And then when we get out on the live dates, going again, he'll defend his Southern Area title or maybe do a, an English title eliminator or something like that. For me, he's already passed the English level, but like I said, I don't want to, to pitch him in too deep because then we're taking chances that we don't necessarily have to do. He's only had like 10, 11 fights, something like that. So we can still build him gradually. And he, like I say, he's good enough now. I'm not just a promoter speaking about his boxer. I'm telling you, I 100% believe he's good enough now to be in, in the world ratings, to be in there, but it doesn't make sense to me right now to be pushing him in those kind of fights when there's plenty of stepping stones between the level he's been fighting at and where we're going to get to. And by the time that we then get to that level, he'll be more than ready for it. I mean, we're going to Las Vegas again in the summer with him. He came out last year, um, sparred with the Olympic uh, silver medalist Brazilian guy, Falcão, mm -hmm. and um, Esquiva Falca in the top rank gym and we'll go and work with them again. Brilliant, brilliant sparring for Daryl. Daryl came on a, a huge amount and because he improved so much then his confidence goes with it and he's come back and he's using all the things that he's picked up. Uh, so we're definitely going out there, going with uh, Larry Kandaya as well, we'll be taking him out there. Yeah, just just Daryl and Larry or is there another uh, moment, Yeah, I mean there might be others, maybe Elliot Matthews. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to take people out there as cannon fodder because good, good guys in those. Like we work in, we work in Mayweather's gym, we work in uh, the top ranked gym. Uh, that you're fighting world class guys. That you know, I'm not going to mm -hmm. take people that are going to go and be cannon fodder for them, boosting confidence. So. You briefly just mentioned um, Elliot Matthews there. I walked past him as I came in today. What's what's his plans? I know it was unfortunate uh, getting pulled out against Nick Blackwell with a cut. Um, what's, what's next for him? Do you know, that, that was incredible bad luck. Um, what happened last year, obviously he lined up for the British title and to suffer a cut in the last round of his last spa before he, he goes and fights for the British title. Um, it, was, it was terrible bad luck, that's boxing, that's life. We have to pick ourselves up. Even from, look, I know Elliot, he didn't really say anything to me about it, but I've been to Las Vegas with Elliot. See, when we go out there, and I'm sort of either sharing a room, I've shared a room with Elliot, I've shared a room with Daryl. You're, you're waking up together, separate beds. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to breakfast together, you're having lunch together, you're having dinner together. But for me as a manager, that's invaluable because I'm learning about these guys. I'm learning how they react in certain situations, both in the ring, in the sparring, and outside of it mentally, how they approach things. And with, with Elliot, um, his fight being cancelled, just me as his manager, I was uh, massively down, I was depressed for about three weeks afterwards. I felt awful, I felt hollow, I felt like really, really deflated and disappointed and uh, just gutted, absolutely gutted. And uh, you have to pick yourself up. But it's not my British title show, it's Elliot's. So I can only imagine how Elliot, I know Elliot's going through the pain barrier every day, training, preparing, working, working, working. He's a hard working guy. For him to go through that, and look, my office is downstairs in the gym. I can see the work that Elliot's putting in because he trains in, in a, the Lionhouse Marino Elite Gym. I see what he's going through. For him to go through that every day for two months, in fact, going before that, but two months intensely, building up to his fight, to then, as a consequence to a ridiculous stroke of bad luck, getting cut. He had a head guard on, they had big gloves, he just got caught at an awkward angle and it, it tore the skin. Um, 
he must have been really, really down. He must have been. There's no way that he mm -hmm. can not. And because I've spent that time with him, I sort of knew how to stop him from crashing too low, because boxers can. Do you know what? They can go out and put two stone on in a month. Um, and just helping him digest it and trying to be there for him. You can't take the pain away from what happened. Mm -hmm. and it, it, we can't. It's a fact. That's what happened. We have to deal with it. But maybe made me, uh, as a human being, able to better understand what he's going through. And because we've been through things together before, for example, we go out to Vegas, very challenging, very hard work, hard sparring, guys trying to literally take their head off. Um, and we have to get through that. We've been under that pressure and it, it, I think it, it helps us sort of gel and, and bond. And uh, I have a very strong bond with, with Elliot. Actually, with quite a lot of the guys that I manage, which I don't necessarily believe in. And I've had many, many promoters that are sort of far more established and higher up than, than what I was, especially at the time that they took their time to, to sit down. And the criticism they've had of me is, Mickey, you love your boxers too much. You're far too involved emotionally. But I try to distance myself to a degree because you've got to make uh, decisions sometimes that are not um, based on your affection for the box. It's basically based on business and making the, the most of the opportunity that's there. Um,